Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 23rd episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview founders, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. I'm your host, Nick Dupuy. First, I want to give a big thank you to Mo Plasnik, co-founder and CEO of CodeShip, who you can listen to in episode 15 for introducing me to today's guest. And today's guest is Karin Brandt, founder and CEO of CoUrbanize. CoUrbanize allows residents to participate in the development process of their neighborhood, whether that's texting and ideas for shops in a new development, or understanding the impact on traffic and shadows of a new building, all without having to go to public meetings or dig through stacks of paper. A few things Karin talks about in this episode are what the Techstars experience was like for her, the benefits of co-urbanized for real estate developers and municipalities, how planners and developers can go about getting engagement from the community, and how they are using sentiment analysis to better understand the community's feelings. If you like today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you can get all the new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And as always, you can find today's show notes at startupbostonpodcast.com. Enjoy today's episode. Karen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. When uh, when Mo first introduced us and I took a look at what you what you did, I thought, well, this is something that I never would have ever thought about. And then I looked more into what you did and I said, I realized how big of a, a problem it was and how important it was that you were solving it. Um, so before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about your background and who you are? Sure. Uh, so my background is actually in city planning. So I went to lots of public meetings. Um, if if you've never been to a public meeting, I often explain Corbinize as if you've seen Parks and Rec, then you know the problem that we're solving. <laughs> um, planners are really the, the brokers of facts and information between developers proposing new projects and community members. And where this happens is at public meetings. <laughs> Basement of City Hall, 7 o'clock on a Tuesday night. So when did you identify the need for a platform such as Corbinize? So it was really when I was going to a lot of public meetings and seeing how few people were there. You know, we're building projects and we're shaping communities for the future generations, but those voices often aren't being heard. And it was really when um, I talked to real estate developers that I saw the challenges um, on the from the challenges that they faced, and how a platform like Courbanize could really help them build better projects faster. Okay. Can you explain also uh, what Corbinize does? Sure. So Corbinize is an online community engagement platform, and we help real estate developers and planners have online conversations with community members about projects being proposed and built in their neighborhood. Okay. So what does the, the current process look like for vetting these projects, and then how does Corbinize improve on that? Sure. So currently when a project is being proposed, uh, developers will share plans at public meetings and whoever shows up can weigh in on whether a project should move forward or not or whether it should be changed. And what often happens is these projects meetings last for a very long time. They can be very slow and sometimes projects might get canceled or sometimes they're changed so drastically that or the process has been going on for so long that the developer is starting to run out of money because every month of delay is hundreds of thousands of dollars lost. Projects can be canceled because of community opposition from just a few voices. Did you find that going to those plannings that it was really just the same people going to the meetings? It's often a, a group of people that will go to all of the meetings. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes our customers might refer to those folks as the season ticket holders. <laughs> <laughs> So what information do developers share on your platform? So they share basic information about what the project is. So there's images where you can see project renderings, public benefits. Now, these things might be affordable housing, sustainability, new parks or open space. There's a timeline of the entire project so you can see when it's actually going to be built. Uh, we also do impact visualizations. So we basically take the data from engineering reports and show you how a project will impact traffic, parking, shadows, or wind in your neighborhood. Um, and then there's a place where the developer can write updates to keep the community informed about new milestones and progress. There's a, a place where 
um, people can write comments and ask questions to connect with the developer. It's almost an online community meeting portal. So the, for example, like the shadows and the traffic, is that the visualizations that you do, is that something the developers give you the, the data for and then you put it on the map? Exactly. The developers give us the data and where that data is currently, it's it's in a 300 page PDF often. Uh -huh. And so the challenge is, unless you're a traffic engineer, it might be really difficult to understand what the data means in real terms for traffic in your community. You probably wouldn't want to read the whole thing either. Or even right. download it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're so, big files. How do people interact with the developers on the platform? So people can ask questions directly to the developer um, or make comments. So I'll give you a couple examples of some pro some comments that we've seen in Forest Hills recently. There's a, We have a new project in Jamaica Plains around the Forest Hills tea station on Corbinize. And people have been saying, you know, here are my concerns here's what I like. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for communicating with us. And I think what what I really like about that is it's very constructive and it's very positive dialogue. Um, you know, People are hearing about a project before there's maybe an unpleasant article about it in the local newspaper about such and such big developers coming mm -hmm. in and changing the community. Instead, you're being asked to proactively to put out your comments, put out your questions directly to the project team so they can take those and iterate and incorporate them into the project to make it better. How does the community find out that they can use this platform to interact with certain developers on these projects? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something I'm really excited about how our business has developed over the last uh, six to nine months is we've really created a playbook around community engagement. How do we direct people to the projects on Core Benai so that they know and can have the ability to shape projects in their neighborhood. And we do this by a variety of ways. Um, we typically sit down with the project team and understand who's their target audience and who do they need to reach that's not coming to the meetings. Often that's a pretty big population, but we might use unique tools and channels in order to reach that population. So uh, some of them are postcards, direct mailings. We do a lot with social media targeting, specific zip codes. Uh, we also have more recently done a lot more with text messaging. So this is our connecting in spaces feature where we post signs around a project site asking you a really fun question. Like, hey, what do you love about this neighborhood? Hey, what would make you come and use this, this building? What, what type of stores would you like to see here, for example? And you can just text in an idea and it goes directly to the comments section and you get a text message back inviting you to sign up to follow the project. So it's lowering that barrier to entry of finding out about a development in your community. <laughs> the, the text messaging one is interesting, I think, because if you put up the sign, obviously the people that see that sign are the ones that are going to be the most affected by that building or whatever it is being constructed there. Yes. So since, uh, well, can you tell us about other projects you have going on in the city of Boston? Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot happening in the city of Austin right now. I mentioned the Forest Hills project in Jamaica Plain. Uh, we also have projects in Roxbury, Dorchester. We have new projects starting in Brighton that we're very excited about. Oh. Um, and there's also a project that's happening all over the city of Boston, which is Imagine Boston 2030, the first, the city's first master plan in 50 years. And so we've seen hundreds and hundreds of comments from Boston residents um, adding ideas about where there are opportunities to enhance and grow the city. What's going on in Brighton? Ooh, it hasn't launched yet. You'll have to stay tuned. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I live. That's what I was wondering. Uh, so since the city started using Corbinize, how has engagement improved? We've seen a lot more people participating in influencing and shaping plans and projects in Boston than I think people who would typically show up to a meeting, which is really exciting. We see so many people writing comments Hey, I'm sending this because I can't come to the meeting tonight. I'm off to work. Or you know, people can't get a babysitter. A lot of families find it really difficult to show up to meetings. You know, people who are working late, um, people who are renters who might not know that they can actually participate. So we're reaching a, a different crowd of people that the city has said is really great to hear from and incorporate their feedback. Is it, are you also saying that you're reaching larger like demographics and different you know, age ranges than you or just attending the meetings in person. Right. And we have a partnership with the city where they've posted a lot of 
or all of their projects that are happening on city owned land with the Department of Neighborhood Development. And so many of those projects are in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and other places of Boston where you might think that people might not have as much access to computers, but we're finding quite the opposite. I'll give an example. The city of Boston initially thought that when they went to some of their community meetings in Dorchester that some of the, the senior population who generally show up might not go on Corbin Ice. So it's a two-pronged strategy. You have the meetings, and you use Corbin Ice to supplement those meetings to reach the people uh, online who are not able to come. But when they went to the meeting and pulled Corbin Ice up, the seniors pulled out their phones and started <laughs> signing up on Corbin Ice. So it's really great to see, even in the, the couple of years since we've started Corbin Ice, just how much mobile penetration has really grown across different communities and across the U.S., can you talk a little bit about the sentiment analysis that you use? Yeah, so our software runs sentiment analytics on all of the comments that people write on Corbin Ice. And we look at keywords and phrases to determine the level of positivity, negativity, neutrality. And we provide data-driven insights to our customers around this level of sentiment around different topics. So maybe it's helpful for them to see people are more negative about traffic and they're more positive about some of the public benefits, mm -hmm. for example. We also look at the sentiment over time. So sometimes projects might start off more negative and the customer is able to neutralize that negativity by either addressing the concerns, um, making uh, changes to the project, or engaging more voices. Interesting. Have you seen changes to projects being made based off of those? Uh, we have seen changes. Um, oftentimes, you know, development is a pretty iterative process and people or customers might incorporate uh, more parking or more amenities like uh, zip car spaces or bicycle improvements. Um, a lot of times we see more affordable housing added to a project. What are some of the tactics and methods that can be used by developers in order to drive more engagement? I think that the best thing developers can do to drive more engagement is to show that engagement is meaningful. So when people ask questions or make comments, they've taken the time out of their day to, one, learn about a project and, and add their voice. And when a developer responds, you know, thanks for your comment, and, and provides some feedback or, or insight into how they're thinking about incorporating that, or maybe they're saying, we can incorporate that because of market research or different plans and projects, but taking the time to, to hear people and dialogue with them, I think is the most important factor in driving more engagement, mm -hmm. as well as continuing to keep people updated. Uh, a lot of our customers post many updates and keep people in the loop as the process evolves and as more milestones are hit before construction comes. Do you find that people are more accepting of new developments when they are able to voice their opinions on things? I do think so. I think that strongly development and change in general can be very emotional. And when change happens in your neighborhood and you weren't informed about it or you didn't feel like you were part of the process, people's response can be very emotional and negative naturally. And so just by including people in the process, asking them, getting their consideration, informing them, I think really starts to remove some of that emotion and starts to drive more of a positive dialogue that's fact-based. What has been the most difficult part for you with growing Corbinize? One of the challenges for Corbinize where you're disrupting an old traditional industry is that real estate is very traditional. Um, we're asking developers to drastically change their behavior. So developers traditionally might hope that Nobody hears about their project. The night of a meeting, there's a snowstorm and nobody shows up. The cranes came, the cranes can come in and that's the first time people about, hear about a project and there's nothing they can do. <laughs> 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 I think that this is still the dream and the intuitive behavior for many developers is, is to hope that nobody hears about it. Um, and that's just not possible today with all of the media and with all of the, the ways that people can access data. If you start your approach that way and people find out that you've been hiding from them, you're in a very bad position. So 
So what we're doing is maybe uncomfortable for developers. We're asking them to be proactive about engaging people. We're asking them to be transparent. And what we're finding and what we're showing them is that this can actually help you build a better project faster and have a better reputation and relationship with the community. And so because development takes so long, it can take many, many months, if not years, to get through this process and get shovels in the ground. Getting those proof points takes a while, but now we've gotten great testimonials, we've gotten customer case studies to show this really does work. And now we're starting to see other developers who maybe were more afraid of being open, they're seeing the light and they're starting to adopt Corbinize as well. How does Corbinize help them uh, get their projects finished faster? One, I remember this very key moment when we were thinking about starting a company like Corbinize. We were very much iterating, developing prototypes, talking to people, going to lots of meetings. And I was talking to a developer and I asked them, you know, what if you had this type of information about what people were saying before you got to a meeting? And the developer said, oh, any information we have about what the community is thinking or saying before we get to a meeting is gold. That's when I knew we had a customer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so for developers, they have to be able to know what people are thinking and be able to build a project that meets community needs fast. Like I said before, every month of delay can be hundreds of thousands of dollars lost. And so if you go to a meeting and people are really upset about construction, but your agenda was to talk about the landscaping, you've now lost that meeting. Your development team has to go back, redo the plans, and come back to next month's meeting, and you've lost a month. And that happens all the time. Or there might be a community group that says, we don't like this project, we don't want it to happen. That's three people, that's very organized, and they can slow down the entire process or even stop a project if you haven't shown that there are other people who are supportive of it. So by helping them get it done faster, you can also save them a lot of money. It seems we like. can save them a lot of money, but I think one of the really key things is if a, if a developer gets the project done faster, they have more money to spend on things like public amenities, public benefits, so more affordable housing, doing better for the community. Mm -hmm. if, if the neighborhood has drawn out the process with opposition, the developer is running out of money and they have to return, uh, they have to, return to their investors, so the public benefits pot gets very small. What have been some of the largest changes that you've made to the platform? I think one of the largest changes that we've made recently is is really about the text message integration. Thinking about how do we talk to our um, talk to community members to make development, which can be very boring and dry. I'm aware, <laughs> <laughs> and often planners and developers use specific language that's very um, jargony. We're really trying to make everything very you know, visionary, really accessible, and even fun like to, to, to imagine that this process of going to public meetings for three hours on a Tuesday night on hard chairs instead of eating dinner or drinking a glass of wine, that this process can actually be fun, um, that you can text message ideas and dream and shape your neighborhood. Um, that's really the goal, and that's um, a lot of the things that we're doing right now has really changed, um, changed how we think about making the process fun. Do you see any trends that are happening in the city that will affect the city's urban planning in the future? Well, obviously one of the biggest trends, and this is not necessarily new, but the cost of housing is just incredible in Boston. I mean, it really rivals New York City in some instances, and it stems from a lack of building to keep up with demand. So we just have a supply and demand problem, and I think it's going to take years to balance out. There's a lot of product coming on the market, in the next five years, you're seeing so much more construction happen. All of these apartments and residential towers are going to be on the market. Um, but I think it's going to take a while to, to really balance that out. You have so many people who are moving to the city to retire who have money that can afford a fancy place at Pier 4, for example. And I'm starting to see people, um, young families, who are actually moving to Waltham or to Watertown, where they can afford. So it's interesting. I think we're starting to see different shifts back and forth. I want to talk a little bit about Techstars. 
Uh, so you took place in Techstars in 2013. Why did you decide to take place in an accelerator program? Uh, well, it was my first startup, and for our Fani team, it was any of our first companies. So, you know, we really had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the, the key things was we wanted to be part of the tech community because we thought that would be really important for our success. What was the biggest lesson that you took away from it? I came from grad school at MIT where I thought that we were going to be learning numbers crunching, business plans, <laughs> <laughs> you know, pen and paper, like reading books. Um, I don't know what I was thinking, but the most critical thing that Techstars was about was about team development and personal development, how your team works together, how you can be functional, how you can have really high emotional intelligence to deal with really tough things. There's so many ups and downs in startups. How does your team function? How do you get over those hurdles and scale? How do you grow together? And I think one of the big things is you need a community of support in order to survive. You need people you can call on when times are tough who are going to help you and who can share real honest learnings. What was the whole Techstars experience like for you? It was extremely fast. It was three months, but we started Techstars. We were one of the earliest companies. We had a really rough prototype that I had even helped code. It was so bad. <laughs> and so we started um, really writing the first code and building the database of what is now Corbinize. So we starting literally from scratch. And at the end of Techstars on dem Demo Day stage, uh, we had launched our product live the week before with a customer, which was the city of Boston. And we'd signed LOIs with, uh, for real estate developers, prominent developers in the city of Boston. So we went from literally nothing to bringing on customers wow. and launching and getting users who are having a dialogue with the city of Boston. All in three and months. then we spent a lot of time recuperating <laughs> <laughs> and rebuilding and redoing the code. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who is going to be participating in an accelerator program? I think if you're a first time entrepreneur, it's super valuable. It will cement your team together, which is so critical. But I would also evaluate the quality of the program and do you do your due diligence just because there are so many accelerator programs right now. I want to move now into our rapid fire questions, mm -hmm. not necessarily rapid fire answers. So the first <laughs> question is, what's another startup in Boston you're most excited about? I have to give a shout out to Art Lifting. I love Liz Powers. She is so much fun, and everybody who meets her just loves her, wants to help her. And just what art lifting does with um, providing art and helping homeless populations, I just think it's, it's a no-brainer. It's amazing. What's something about you that most people don't know? Um, I'm from Iowa. And my personal cell is from Iowa, and when I call people, most people answer the phone like, oh, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> Someone from Iowa called. <laughs> What are your favorite tools that make your life and work easier? Uh, I would say Evernote. I'm in Evernote every single day. If if Evernote went away, I don't know what I would do with my life because that's all there. I'd also say my bike. If I'm not riding my bike to work or my bike home, then my day is off because it's, it's my time to clear my head and get ready for work, process things, and be outside. Do you have any favorite blogs or books? Uh, for books, I love Juno Diaz. Uh, he's a professor at MIT and he writes books about uh, kind of the, the immigrant experience from the Dominican Republic in the U.S. He's just brilliant. Sometimes I see him around Cambridge and like, oh, sign my book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of blogs, I read Fred Wilson's blog and Joanne Wilson's blog. Joanne's an investor in Carbonize and I think the world of both of them. What advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Ooh, I think that there are so many more opportunities in the world than I ever knew were open to me when I was 20. I think if I could go back and tell myself to think bigger, that's, that's the, what I would do. I thought at that time I was going to get a career, maybe have an office, do the same thing for 10, 15 years, <laughs> <laughs> you know, really boring stuff. So there are other options. <laughs> there are just, other options. Just, go build something. <laughs> Uh, just a few final questions here to close out. Where can people find out more about Coorbanize? www.coorbanize.com. <laughs> and where can people connect with you online? 
Uh, I'm on Twitter at Carbrandt, K-A-R-B-R-A-N-D-T, or on LinkedIn. And lastly, do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the people listening? Yeah, I think Boston is an incredible startup ecosystem. It's a fantastic community. You just have to get into the community. So start going to events, start talking to people, get coffees. Everyone's here to help. Um, so just get to know one another. All right. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You'll get all my new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And if you really liked today's episode, it would mean a lot to me if you could write a review of the podcast as well. Just go to startupbostonpodcast.com slash iTunes. And remember, you can find all show notes with links at startupbostonpodcast.com. Until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com. Or reach out on Twitter at Startup Boss Cast. That's Startup B-O-S Cast. Cheers.